All right, hello everyone, welcome back to CHRTC 309. This is, of course, Sociology of Youth and Religion. Okay, so in uh, in this next kind of section here, I'm gonna be looking at a few of the arguments and, and findings that Jean Twenge had in her book, iGen, about the religious lives of, uh, of teenagers, right? Of, of Gen Z teenagers. Uh, and specifically, she calls the chapter "Losing My Religion and Spirituality." So that you know should tell us something about what uh, what she found. All right, so here we have a couple of things blended on a single graph, right? So two data sets, one from the excellent data set, <clears throat> which is monitoring the future, the other from the general social survey, right? So what does the monitor, monitoring the future show? Well, basically that you know. Uh, percentage of young people with any religious affiliation, um, you know, basically has been dropping for a long time, right? And they have our, our list of eighth graders, um, you know, in the long dotted line, the gray line, 10th graders and uh, 12th graders, right? And we see, you know, and it's not surprising, um, you know, it starts at a pretty high ebb, right? In the 1970s, over 90%, uh, 90, around 90 or over 90%, basically had a religious affiliation and it has been dropping steadily, you know, as we go forward uh, to 2015. Now it's still a, a, a in the US, right? This is American stats, um, a vast majority, right? Still above 75% for eighth, 10th and 12th graders, right? And you know, our eighth graders are still in the like over 80% range, um, <clears throat> even, into 2015, right? So relatively late, and still a lot of religious affiliation, but we see a general downward trend. Now that that kind of uh, dotted line that really looks like it's dropping off really quickly, right? That is our general social survey. So this is grabbing our emerging adults, right? And this tells a, a altogether, I think, more um, depressing picture if you are religious and care about religion. Um, I mean, I mean, basically, where do we start, right? Religion was kind of at a, a, a lower ebb, I think, in the 1970s, right? Only, you know, somewhere in the high 80s um, said they had a religious affiliation. By 19, kind of beginning of the 1990s, and this is consistent uh, with some of the other trends I showed you, right? Religious affiliation kind of jumped up and peaked for young adults, right? Up into the, you know, up upper 90% range. And from there, you know, from kind of the early 90s forward, it has just been an absolute um, drop off, right? So that by 2015, you know, in terms of young adults, only about two thirds are identifying as um, as with any religion, right? So that's a 30% loss uh, almost in, uh, you know, a couple of decades, which is really, really significant. So, you know, especially since like this bottom ebb here, you know, this, this last kind of section, is representing Gen Z, um, you know, we see that they are g definitely becoming less religious than their boomer um, Gen X and, and even millennial peers were at roughly the same age. So what Gene Twenge suggests is that there seem to be two kind of, I think, connected forces um, drawing iGeners or, or Gen Zers away from religion simultaneously. So, you know, as we talked about, when we're talking about the nuns, right? Um, there's more of them being raised in non-religious homes, right? We're now sometimes talking second and third generation nuns, um, people who are who just have not been raised in any kind of religious context. And increasingly, right, as you get more and more non-religion, it becomes a more socially acceptable option. And so even those who are raised with religion, right, in, in a religious tradition, start to see being non-religious as a viable option, right? Whereas, like I said in, the, uh, in other lectures, in the past, right, everybody would have been something, right? Like whether you went or not, whether you were active or not, uh, it didn't really matter in some way. You were going to be a something, right? It might not have been, you know, a practicing Methodist or a practicing Baptist or a practicing Muslim, but you were something, right? You you would have had a religious identity that was at least there potentially, and, and then, you know, potentially could be activated for more intensity later on if, uh, you know, if if the need arose, 
But increasingly, right, people have become non-religious. They've seen friends who are non-religious. And it's become a more acceptable kind of social position, which also then seems to be drawing more people away from religion, right? And, you know, this happens in all sorts of ways. You know, romantic, your romantic partner's non-religious and, and you would kind of want to attune yourself to their beliefs because you care what your religious partner thinks or it makes it more viable. So you, you go down that path. Um, you know, you have lots of friends who are non-religious and you start to be like, oh, well, I'm religious and they aren't. Well, they're still good people. Well, obviously that's okay then. All sorts of things like this, right? So these two things, Twangy thinks, are, are probably contributing to kind of a generalized decline uh, for iGeners in terms of, uh, of their religious lives, right? It's just not as deeply entrenched socially, and so it's a more viable option. Uh, and the more, you know, and it's, it's got that snowball effect. The more of them leave, the more it seems viable and even maybe desirable for people. Okay, so we talk about, say, the plausibility structure of, um, of religion. With Gen Z, it seems pretty evident that the plausibility structure, you know, what has held religion together for a long time and made it seem plausible, and particularly, you know, the truth claims that religious texts, so, I mean, if we're talking about the West, right, and we're talking about America, we're really talking about three principal ones, which is the, the Torah in Judaism, the Bible um, for Christians, and the Quran for, for Muslims. Increasingly, Gen Z, and, and this has been going on for a long time, um, seem to be thinking of these as merely human creations. Now, fundamentally, and, and this is my commentary rather than Twenge's, I think this is an outgrowth of something that's been going on within Christianity for a long time. So basically, in the in the 19th century, you know, Protestants, especially in Germany, basically started to think about the Bible in a, a completely different way. And what they started to do was called historical criticism. And basically, you know, that involved looking at a bunch of things. The but principally the historical um, context principally in which books of the Bible were composed, right? So they would take something like the book of Isaiah, right? The, the prophecies. And they'd say, oh, okay, well, like, if we dig down and we look at, you know, the, the Hebrew texts that we have of Isaiah, well, it looks like there's at least, you know, based on grammar and stuff, two or three different authors of Isaiah. So, okay, what can we say? Well, it looks like, you know, we think that you know, the first part of Isaiah or Isaiah 1 was written by this person uh, or someone kind of in and around this time who had this sort of outlook and was trying to communicate this message. This got added on to by whoever wrote the second part of Isaiah, right, who was this kind of person and aimed it at this audience and it was probably in this kind of historical period um, and, and so on and so forth, right? Like really deeply look, and they did this for the entire Bible, right? The Gospels, um, you know, all the Old Testament books, trying to parse kind of in the deep structure of the text where it came from and who the human authors were. Um, so this, this approach is called historical criticism. It's an incredibly like fruitful way of approaching the biblical text in lots of ways, right? Uh, people have learned a ton from doing this about who authored it, but it's had the effect in a lot of ways of kind of stripping bare these texts and how, you know, how much of them appear to be, you know, very, very human. Now, this is not surprising, right? Like, one of the, the things we know is they're, they're written down by someone, right? They're not, uh, you know, sent down from, from heaven directly. You know, they had at least someone, you know, human authorship in some way. Um, whether you think it was, through, you know, they were received through some kind of divine revelation or, you know, inspiration of some kind, um, you know, there, a human at some point put pen to paper and wrote them down. So we know that there's, there's a human element to any sacred book, right, from any religion. They all come from, from human beings somehow, whether you think there's a, a sacred component to that as well, um, you know, that those humans had to write it down at some point. 
Um, so, I mean, some of that is not particularly um, surprising. But I, I think what historical criticism kind of did was really, you know, point out how human a lot of these texts are, how grounded in particular historical moments they are, um, you know, how they emerge as, as, you know, a response to something that was happening uh, or questions that people were having, you know. Um, you know, some of the stories are, are the same, right? If you look at something like uh, the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles uh, in, in the Bible, right? They tell the same story, but from a different perspective because they were written at different times where the authors had different emphasis. All these things sort of come out through historical criticism. What it does, though, also, I think, is it strips away some of the sense that these are, you know, divinely inspired or, or divinely revealed texts in some way, really kind of bringing forward how human they are. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Now, it starts with Christians, right? Like I said, in, in Germany in the 19th century. But eventually, right, this spreads obviously to Judaism because Christians are working with, with the Hebrew Bible for the Old Testament or the, the Torah. Um, and then even to, to Islam, right? Where, uh, you know, they people are looking at the Quran and other kind of important texts in Islam and doing the same kind of historical criticism. And I think, you know, well, like a lot of things, I don't think Gen Z is necessarily aware of the whole history that has maybe led up to, to this idea of, of, you know, picking apart or, or desacralizing or deep analysis of religious texts. Um, they seem to be aware on the surface that there's a, a deeply human element to this. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, uh, is definitely a thing. And uh, definitely what we see with Gen Z is that they are much less, um, I guess, traditional in the sense of thinking of these sacred books as having something sacred about them. They see them as a simply human texts, right? Outgrowths of, of mythologies and cultures um, that are, are, you know, in a lot of ways, probably no more relevant or truthful than, you know, the Greek myths or something like the Aeneid, the Odyssey, uh, Ovid's Metamorphose, or, or any of these things from which we get, you know, the Greek and Roman myths. Um, fully human creations. Um, so, you know, digging into them and seeing their sort of human roots has had the, the effect of, of making them so human in a sense that they look to Gen Z like a lot of other mythologies. Now, there's also a lot of cultural forces that have played into this, right? Uh, potentially the rise of, of the sort of what was referred to as the new atheism um, in the in the early 2000s, really, probably plays a role in this as well. Some particularly um, adept rhetoricians, like the late uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris, and, and I think to a lesser extent, um, Richard Dawkins, um, have, you know, compared in unfavorable ways, um, you know, the Bible in, in particular, but the Quran as well, to ancient myths and, and you know, often in snarky ways. Um, suggested that, uh, you know, these are merely fairy tales and should be abandoned. You know, I, I think I, it's either Dawkins or Hitchens that's fond, I can't remember which, um, that's fond of, uh, you know, comparing belief in God to, uh, you know, a belief in the tooth fairy. Or Santa Claus, right, as these sort of things that should be believed only by children. And to some extent, I think this has trickled down into popular consciousness so that Gen Z kind of is carrying around this assumption set that, yeah, these are, are myths or, or, you know, myths, but in the, the pejorative kind of sense of myth, right? The sense that says, you know, untrue stories told by, in a sense, primitive cultures to explain things they couldn't understand. So, I mean, all in all, not surprisingly, I think um, this has led to declines in kind of a whole number of religious kind of beliefs and behaviors. Um, so, I mean, not the least of which it, just belief in God, you know, which is this, this line right here, um, has declined, right, from over 85% in, uh, you know, the 1990s, the high kind of watermark. 
um, down to, you know, uh, um, into the 60s, you know, by the time we hit around 2015. Um, believe in an afterlife, you know, weirdly in the like 1970s, it was at a kind of low ebb, popped up in the, you know, by the 1980s, mid 80s kind of popped down really kind of surges a belief in the afterlife to, you know, almost 90% in like the early 2000s, which is, is kind of interesting. And then it has kind of reduced. We may have aberrant data points there. Um, you know, I am not 100% sure what's going on there. Um, belief in the afterlife, though, can be a very general belief, and I don't think we should read too much into it, right? Uh, I, I don't, I know that certainly I've been to the you know, funeral of people whose family members were quite secular, um, you know, either atheists or agnostics, uh, or certainly nothing in particulars, um, who would, you know, in kind of comforting manner say, well, they're in a better place, uh, you know, they're, I don't know, so whatever, I can't, I can't remember, I remember finding it absurd at the time, um, you know, given you know, that none of these people had any kind of structured religious faith, but they still had some sense of like, uh, you know, an afterlife, um, though, though could they have defined what it was? Probably not. Um, and, you know, so the afterlife one is, is interesting, but I don't think indicative of much. Um, what else do we have here? Ever pray this solid line, you know, this one right here. Interesting, right? So, you know, back in the early 2000s, I guess they started the general social survey started asking this around 2004. Um, and then uh, we've seen, you know, more almost, you know, the high 80s or I guess 84 percent probably, um, you know, in, in around 2004. And it's dropped down. It's still a pretty healthy number. It's saying ever pray, you know, probably about 74, 73, 74 percent. Um, so still, you know, three quarters of, of uh, you know, people 18 to 24 are saying that they ever pray so that's you know still pretty good um you know a pretty good number a pretty solid number and all of these are in, in majority territory still right but definitely we see sharp declines um what's this last one believe the bible is the inspired word of god and you kind of see right that was pretty steady in the 80s and then we hit kind of when gen z starts to come on uh, you know, I guess millennials and then Gen Z start to come on the scene and it, it takes a hard drop and you kind of see that in the, the GSS data. Okay, so I mean all indicators rate, less religious, you know, belief in afterlife, praying, believe the Bible is the word of God and belief in God are all on the decline as, you know, we get into the younger generational cohorts. I don't think any of this should surprise anyone at this point, uh, but, you know, definitely still there. Okay, so when Twenge was looking at it, um, you know, what she saw were basically a lot of race and class divides in religion. Um, you know, and, and some of these, you know, when we, we looked at the religious landscape stuff, you know, are starting to even out a little bit um, in terms of, uh, you know, blacks and, uh, and Hispanics in the U.S. Still more religious than their, their white counterparts, but it's, you know, they're, they're all kind of going in the same direction. But okay, like as of you know, 2015, when most of her data comes from, you know, African. So we're we're talking almost a decade ago now. African Americans were still more religious, uh, or blacks were still more religious than uh, than white people. Um, now, interestingly, and this actually remains the case. Um, and and you know, one of the big divides in religion increasingly is between um, the highly educated uh, and uh, people with only a high school diploma or less, but basically the more educated your parents are, and this might strike some of you as odd, but I can back this up with a lot of statistics if, if you're interested. Um, the more educated your parents are, the more likely you are to be religious, right? Especially compared to those whose parents only have a high school education or less. So edu you know, this, this has led people like Ryan Burge to suggest that increasingly religion in, in America, and I think this is the case in Canada as well, increasingly in a lot of cases is, is something of a luxury good. Uh, something that only the wealthiest and uh, those who have, in a sense, done everything right um, can sort of, not that they can afford, that, that isn't quite right, um, but they're the only ones that seem to continue to be religious now i mean there, there's some disagreement like ryan will will suggest that you know religious communities are often not um 
all that amenable to people who perhaps they feel haven't lived life in the right way. That was his kind of interpretation uh, of the data, right? Like uh, religious communities are, are perfectly happy to have you as long as you, you know, got married, you know, you have your 2.5 kids, um, you know, you, you kind of live the right way. And, and, you know, it's only people who are kind of in the upper classes that seem able to kind of live that lifestyle, according to Ryan Burge. Others have looked at the same data, um, and there was a bit of a debate around Ryan's kind of work here, and suggested that potentially, you know, like, especially when it comes to life outcomes and, you know, total income, uh, you know, and lifestyle kind of questions, you know, whether you're able to get to college, it's possible that being religious and, and living a kind of religious lifestyle actually inclines you more towards these kinds of actions, right? Like you're going to do things in the right, you know, like in the socially prescribed kind of way that's going to lead you to success if you are religious because religion shares those values. And I think there's something to be said for that. Um, certainly when we look at life outcomes, you know, for teenagers and emerging adults um, and its connection to religion, um, you know, we'll see that there's at least, I think, a case to be made that, you know, because religion in America especially has tended to prescribe things that are socially valued, you know, beliefs and behaviors uh, and, and ways of being, that those who are more religious actually have markedly better life outcomes on the whole. So yeah, I mean, it might not be surprising, right, that the people who are, you know, more religious would be more likely to get a college education, right, to, um, you know, do well in school and, and all of these sort of things. But we can talk about that when we talk about life outcomes. It's quite a fascinating kind of bit of data um, that we can dig into, certainly. But there's definitely an education and kind of race and class divide, middle class and above, more likely to be religious, actually than the poor. Now this I, I think is also interesting and I, I will mention this very very briefly, um, goes against a lot of the instincts people have about religion, right? Especially because people I think in a lot of cases have been been cultivated by a culture that has long sort of believed in a Marxist kind of deprivation theory, right? That people turn to religion because their lives are so insufferable they are so poor and they they lack so much um, that actually that's why they 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 need religion right because it, it gives them hope in an otherwise hopeless world. What's kind of interesting is you know as we we dig into the data as we learn a lot, it actually seems like the middle and upper classes are more religious. Now, not to say that they're overwhelmingly religious, you know, even uh, you know there, there's lots of other things going on. But they're more religious, certainly, than the poor and the working class. And this may be a product of time and leisure, right? They have the leisure to think about religious questions in a way that, you know, if you're working three jobs or you're barely scraping by, you maybe don't have a ton of time to even just consider religious questions. And this is something that Rodney Stark, um, you know, points out, which I, I do think is really interesting, um, you know, in, in some of his work on religion, is that the great religious movements of the past overwhelmingly, you know, really were not driven for the most part from below, right, from, from the kind of working or class or the poor they've been driven principally by you know sort of either middle class or or wealthy you know in a lot of cases if we, if we look at the medieval period or other times around the world um, almost by the aristocracy like uh, the buddha right was a prince muhammad was a, a, a merchant right a relatively wealthy uh, kind of position in that society francis of assisi right the famous catholic saint who founded the uh, the Franciscans, um, you know, and started a whole kind of revolution in, in kind of the way Catholics think about, you know, serving the poor especially. Um, you know, Francis was a nobleman, right? He was the son of a, a very wealthy man, 
uh, cast it all off. But he, he had the leisure, in a sense, to think about it. Um, the Wesley brothers, you know, who founded Methodism, right, were students at Oxford, right? They were wealthy kind of uh, upper class people in their society. Um, and on and on, right? You could go kind of down the list of, of spiritual innovators and really influential um, religious figures and easily find um, that for the most part, they are not poor, right? Then they don't have to be massively wealthy, but they have to have enough wealth to basically be able to take the time to think about spiritual questions. So, you know, one of the things we see, yeah, the more wealthy you are, you know, the more middle class you are, the more you have time to kind of think about spiritual questions. And that does seem to generate more religion. Okay. Regional trends, right? Uh, the U.S. has the same kind of regional trends as, as uh, Canada does. And we, I think we talked a little bit about it in the landscape. Um, you know, in Canada, you know, places like the Maritimes and Alberta are a little bit more religious in some ways than, than the rest of Canada. Um, the U.S. South remains more religious than other parts of the country. You know, what, what's sometimes referred to as the Bible Belt. Um, is more religious than, say, the Northeast or Pacific Northwest, right? The Northeast places around New York, uh, Boston, you know, the, the kind of older part, a more established part um, of the United States. Uh, the younger and, and kind of newer part of the United States, the, the Southwest in, and the Southeast in particular, tend to be a little bit more religious, right? This is why we have this idea of, of the Bible Belt, uh, in, in the U.S., right, this whole section kind of south of the Mason-Dixon line that remains more religious than other parts of the country. Okay, so one of the other things that, that Twenge notes, and no surprise here, is, is what, well, she doesn't call it this, and, and I don't know that she's aware of Christian Smith's research. I think it, it's fair to say that the position about religion that she describes is essentially kind of similar to moralistic therapeutic deism um, and generally a growth of individualism in, in how people see it, right? So if religion is there at all, it's there to serve you and make you feel good, right? So it has that therapeutic kind of idea. Um, Gen Z, she says, really has internalized this idea that science and religion are incompatible and in a sort of death struggle, right? Um, and, and in this kind of battle, religion is at a distinct disadvantage because it doesn't seem modern, right? And therefore doesn't seem worth it. So, I mean, again, I think that this is a, a, an outgrowth of, of a long history, right? Going back to things like the Scopes Monkey Trial, you know, where American fundamentalists, um, you know, tried to ban the teaching of the theory of evolution in, in American schools and, and succeeded, um, at the court level and I think failed at the cultural level pretty spectacularly because they've been roundly mocked for it, leading right through into, you know, the, the 2000s and um, the new atheism, right, where really the new atheists, uh, you know, led by, by guys like Richard Dawkins, um, have suggested that, you know, religion is, is just a bad theory about how the world came to be. And not, I, I think, really... You know, and I, I say this as, as someone who's um, sympathetic um, to religion in lots of ways, doesn't consider what religion actually does, what kind of questions religion actually asks. Um, you know, uh, you know, lots of, of times you'll hear like there's no evidence for the existence of God, um, by which they mean you know you can't put God in a petri dish, which is a claim that no, you know, uh, Muslim. Uh, Hindu, cat, or Christian, or Jew ha has ever made. Um, I mean, I guess some religions do have, you know, like Mormonism has a, a god that has a body, but for most, you know, religious systems, they're talking about a different order of being altogether, um, and, and which would call for a different kind of evidence. But this kind of quick and easy, right, there's no evidence for the existence of God, um, and thinking that the only evidence is, is empirical evidence, um, Whereas you know, other kinds of evidence could be brought to bear, philosophical, theological, personal experience, uh, uh, you know, would serve as, as forms of evidence. And actually, I, I'll say um, Alex O'Connor, who used who is, is an atheist, but used to go as um, under the, the handle on YouTube as Cosmic Skeptic, 
and now has completed, I, I think, a master's or a PhD in, in the philosophy of religion at Oxford, um, has sort of, you know, admitted to this is like, uh, you know, what Christians and, and other people who believe in, in God believe, think of as evidence of the existence of God is quite different, say, than what, um, you know, someone who is like Richard Dawkins, who is, is basically a materialist, um, would consider evidence of the existence of God. And But this kind of distinction seems to have trickled down deeply into Gen Z, where they're on the kind of Richard Dawkins side. It's like, you know, religion doesn't seem modern. It doesn't have evidence by which we mean scientific evidence, right? We can't find physical evidence of God using the scientific method, um, which, you know, if you know anything about philosophy, is a bit of an absurd claim, um, because it's not the kind of evidence that a being like Christians and Muslims and Hindus and Jews think God is. It's not the kind of evidence that it would generate. But they seem to have kind of deeply trickled down into Gen Z. And so they're like, yeah, there's this hostility between science and religion. Science has good evidence. Religion has no evidence. Um, and therefore, religion doesn't seem worth it. It's not modern right? It's old fashioned. Yeah, I, I, I see this in, you know, student comments all the time too, right? It's, it's not progressive. It needs, you know, it's uh, outdated. I think the one of the you know, outdated beliefs, and so it doesn't seem worth it, right? This is deeply kind of ingrained in Gen Z's thinking. Okay, um, on LGBTQ questions, especially um, Gen Z, and, and as I kind of spelled out, you know, in, in that first section on Gen Z, um, that Twenty writes, you know, Gen Z is very tolerant. LGBTQ questions are, are close to their hearts, um, and so you know the the perception that religion in general, but but Christian, because we're talking about America, Christianity in particular, is uh, is anti promotes anti gay attitudes is something they they don't have or anti LGBTQ now. I guess it would be broader even than just anti gay uh, attitudes is something they have no time for at all. Right, so, uh, and you see strong majorities here, right? So Christianity is anti-gay or anti-LGBTQ, you know, fully three, two-thirds um, think that. Is judgmental, you know, religion is judgmental, 62%, and hypocritical, right? That basically, um, you know, religious people are, are hypocritical in some important way. One of the things that, that I think is noteworthy, and, and Twenge sort of alludes to this, is that iGeners really equate, you know, religion and religiosity with niceness. Um, you know, that if you, that they can't really separate an idea of being religious from a kind of, I think, kind of bland idea of just being nice to everybody all the time. Um, and so they can't really reconcile a world where being religious is anything other than being completely nice to everyone all the time. And so these things like, you know, Christian or Hindu or Muslim or Jewish kind of, uh, you know, attitudes on certain sexual behaviors, right? Um, sexual orientations, gender identity, all these things, um, they, they see it as, as it can't be an authentic kind of religiosity because religion should just teach you to be nice to everybody, right? And, and they can't see any world in which a religion has standards right standards of, of behavior that would make people feel bad about themselves um now if you're you know if you ever know anything about catholics i think catholicism um to a great extent is mostly about making you feel bad about yourself i say this jokingly as as someone who was raised catholic right catholic guilt is a, a um a cliche for a reason, but it's something that really doesn't resonate with eye genders, right? This idea that you should feel guilty and not good about yourself um, because of religion is something that they can't quite reconcile. Um, yeah, and I mean, the overwhelming goal of moralistic therapeutic deism, and I think, is to make you a better person. And, you know, anything other than a complete embrace of LGBTQ plus identities for, for Gen Z um, is, is you're a bad person, makes you a worse person, such, you know, and, and as a result, religion is kind of bad, right? And doesn't represent even the real values of, of what, what a religion should have, or, or even what religion should have, right? And this is often done, I, I think, at a very superficial level, right? You'll get people saying, you know, well, well, Jesus never taught anything about 
homosexuality, um, which is true, but it's a rather shallow argument. Um, and, and so they'll say, well, you know, Jesus would have been embracing of everybody, so you should be too. And uh, again, I, there's nothing wrong with that argument. It's a little bit kind of on the surface when it comes to, you know, what, say, Christians believe and why they believe it. Um, but it's something, you know, the iGen can't seem to wrap their heads around, um, you know, making people feel bad and, and not accepting people. That makes you a bad person. And how could an authentic religion or something, a religion that's good, make you a bad person?